Oh, look at you. You're spending another laboratory video with me. Precious time out of your schedule. Precious time out of your semester. And you're going to devote probably an hour or more the next hour with me, your best friend, your instructor in the Orgo 2 course. And I'm so happy that you did. And I so look forward in spending our time together. And I hope that you do too. So in this laboratory video, we are focused on this really fancy title, and the fancy title is called Friedel Craft Acylation of Anisol. Say that five times fast. Friedel Craft Acylation of Anisol. 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 Ha ha! I did it. Can you? So we are looking at the title only, and I want you to take away what the title actually is trying to tell you. Because if you go back and think about the lecture material that we have talked about and discussed at this point in the semester, we have seen Friedel Craft before. Friedel Craft is nothing new. So weeks and weeks ago, we introduced this concept of Friedel Craft. What did it actually mean? What did it do? Can you remember that? Because that's going to be important here. Next is this term, acylation. So when we look at acylation, that's also pretty important. We've seen this before, and we've seen this many weeks ago, and we might really continue to see it right now when we watch this laboratory video together. And then we take a look at the last word, which is called anisole. And we know what anisole is. At least I hope you know what anisole is because we spent quite some time as far as lecture material is concerned around the idea of anisole and all of its other related cousin structures during that time. So basically what I'm trying to get around to you is that if you go back probably four weeks from today and you take a look at the material that was introduced, Benzene reactions, substituted benzene reactions, the ortho, the para, the meta directors. If you look at the acylation, which involved the carbonyl family, now we're talking about carbonyl families and carbonyl reactions. And then all at the same time, at the very end of this laboratory experiment, we're going to be using FTIR in order to determine the product that we have made. So Really, this laboratory does an excellent job, which is why I love it, of wrapping all of this lecture material up into one nice little package for you. So that way I can give it to you with a bow and you can slowly open it up and explore the wonders of this organic chemistry lab. Aren't you excited? Okay, well, uh, without going any further into the lab, I want to take some time and talk about some of the basics that will be happening here with this particular lab experiment. So the very first thing that I want to focus on, it says Friedelcraft acylation of anisole, right? So that means I'm going to have to go back and remember what this structure of anisole actually was. And I hope that you can do this without looking it up because this was one of those particular molecular structures that we wanted you to memorize. All right, so uh, basically, Basically, what that means is that I'm going to go in and I'm going to create this benzene of anisole. And this benzene structure of anisole is a benzene, and anisole was this OCH3 group that happened off of that benzene structure. So again, this goes all the way back from weeks and weeks ago when we first learned about substituted benzenes and about what they did and how they reacted. So this is a substituted benzene, and this substituted benzene is going to undergo a reaction. And this reaction is an acylation reaction. So acylation required a ALCL3 aluminum trichloride when we first learned about it again weeks ago when we first learned about acylation and this was during the time of substituted benzenes but we continued to talk about the acyl group probably in the carbonyl lectures too so ALCL3 is going to be required and very often during this time, we said, well, this ALCL3 has got to be in some type of solvent, and this solvent is typically DCM or dichloromethane, also known as methylene chloride. So here is kind of the catalyst that's going to get this reaction to kind of do what it needs to do. 
And then for this particular type of reaction, we are going to have to isolate it. And isolation requires the addition of a C double bond O. That is what isolation actually did. So we're going to have to have something with a C double bond O. Now, we talked about isolation with acyl chlorides mo mainly. And we said the chloride leaves and the carbon that has the double bond O goes on to the molecule and that's how it attaches. But that's actually not what we're going to be using here. What we're going to be using for this particular reaction is acetic anhydride. But folks, that's okay. Okay, because anhydride is also a acyl containing group. It has a C double bond O group. And that's really what aluminum trichloride and the acylation is going to focus on. So we get this uh, anhydride group, and that's an oxygen actually that's there in between the two carbons. And that is the anhydride. And acetic is this idea that we have two carbons. We learned that from the carbonyl lectures. So here's my first carbon already included in the carbonyl, and there's my second carbon. And it's just acetic anhydride. Uh, I sound kind of crazy if I write down acetic acetic anhydride. No one really says that. It's kind of silly. It's silly sounding, and it's silly for us to do it. So instead, we just write down acetic anhydride, and we understand that the acetic group is actually on both sides, to the left and to the right, and that's what we have here. So just like I've told you in the very beginning of this uh, laboratory lecture, we have a benzene substituted group here. We are reacting that with a type 1 or type 2 carbonyl. I hope that you're telling me type 1 because type 2 is for 2, and that's aldehydes and ketones, and we don't have either one here. It's an anhydride group, and we are isolating that with ALCL3, just like we discussed in all of the lecture material up to this point. So what will happen here is that we know from the background of lecture material that we have already done is that this benzene group is either an OP director or an M director, ortho, para, or meta. And we've got to figure out which one we have. So orthopeda and mera, I can actually go to a table right now and predict which one this is going to be. However, I'm not really going to tell you because that's the purpose of the actual lab experiment. And we're going to see if we're going to determine this the proper way. All right. So the ortho para and the meta is actually based on the typical types of substituents that's on the benzene ring. And the substituent that we have here is the OCH3 group. So I need to ask the question, is this an activator or is this a deactivator, right? That's what this is all about. And if I can determine if these are activators or deactivators, then that will probably tell me or give me a good idea of whether this is going to go ortho para or meta. If I do determine that this is ortho para, then the next question is which and is one preferred over the other. So we've often talked about this in lecture material as well, ortho and para which one shows up more often? Why does it show up more often? What are the limitations of the structural choices when the product actually gets formed? And why does it happen the way that it happens? So that is what this lab experiment is all about. So we are going to end up with a product, and this is a benzene product that still has that OCH3 group. We're not going to do anything to that OCH3. It is an ether structural group. And that ether group is really not going to react or do anything for us because it's a substituted benzene reaction. So at some point in time, I'm just going to kind of go here in the middle and kind of draw the line straight out. And I'm going to write, well, what is the incoming group? Well, that incoming group, just like with any acylation reaction, is this carbon double bond O. And what does it bring with it? Well, if I look at this structure, it's going to go right there and that oxygen with the carbonyl and the other carbon will go off and whee, away it goes and then we have this c double bond o with this uh, ch3 group that is left now the question is i don't really know where is that on the second position is that on the third position is that on the fourth position where is that located and that is why we draw the bond on the center 
So if you've been drawing bonds in the center of these molecules and I've been counting them wrong every time, that is why. Because you're telling me this group is going to go on the benzene ring, but I just don't know where it's going to go. And if you were marked or deducted points during that time, that is why that happened. So that's what you get for Googling answers, because that's what Google is going to tell you. So blame Google for your failing grades. Don't blame me. So we've got this structure, and it's really up to us to figure out what has formed so ortho, meta, para. And then in order to do that, we need FTIR. So this is going to be pretty easy. Uh, first, if I take a look at the starting structure, this thing is an ether group. So ethers don't really have a lot going for them in terms of infrared. Uh, we actually probably didn't talk about ethers that much in detail when we talked about infrared spectra. Uh, but at the end of, of this reaction, we're going to see the addition of a carbon double bond O. And this is a carbonyl, of course, right? And we know that carbonyls, based on infrared spectra, will have a very sharp band at 1700. So that's going to be one of the major differences. Just to determine if we did make the product that we were supposed to have made, I'm going to be looking for the 1700 band that shows up in the FTIR when we do our product analysis. Now, that's not going to tell me where the position is going to be located, right? And the position is going to be located um, either in the second or the third or the fourth position on the ring. And we've got to know, well, which one is it going to be? So in the uh, laboratory procedure document that you probably don't even read most of the time, you're going to see a very brief table over here, probably on like the fourth page in. And this table is actually uh, stated the number of hydrogens here. So the number of hydrogens will be very important for this particular reaction because it's going to tell me bands that I will see in the information red spectrum. So for instance, if we have a benzene ring that had this OCH3 group on it, and let's say that my incoming group, my carbonyl went here in the meta position, right? So here is the incoming group from the acetic anhydride. The FTIR will give me a hint of what's made and how do I determine the actual numbering as far as where the group went. And this is how we do it. Uh, notice that here with this carbon in the middle, there's like one hydrogen only that's there. And then here we have one hydrogen and there we have one hydrogen and here we have one hydrogen. So I want you to pay attention to the table here and the table says number of adjacent hydrogens. So adjacent is going to be the key word here. Adjacent basically means how many hydrogens are side by side. And if I look at this structure, I'm going to see three hydrogens that are side by side here. So if I've got three hydrogens that are side by side, it looks like I'm going to see a signal in the infrared spectrum around 810 to 750. So this is what I need you to do for the conclusion of the experiment. You're going to have to draw all possibilities, the ortho, the meta, and the pair because just by first glance of FTIR, we can pick out the 1700 peak, and I hope that it's there. However, we're going to have to dig a little deeper. Here are the possibilities, and based on this table, this is where the additional peaks that they want me to look for will show up in infrared. And once I figure that out, I then go to the table and say, here's the proof. This is where that incoming group is going to go because it's the only way that I can end up with three adjacent hydrogens that are side by side or two adjacent hydrogens are side by side or four adjacent hydrogens side by side. And now keep in mind, the only way five hydrogens can be adjacent is if the group did not go on there at all. And that means five hydrogens are next door neighbors to each other. So that's what this lab is all about. Again, it's wrapping up benzene reactions with substituted benzene reactions, along with acylations, along with carbonyl families and everything else in between. All right. So uh, now let's get started with what we're actually going to be doing in the lab. So first, I need acetic anhydride. Uh, that's what the directions actually tell me to do. It tells me to take acetic anhydride and blah, 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 measure out how many millimolars or measure out how many mils. Uh, and here is our acetic anhydride that we are using. It is a Flynn Scientific 
uh, SD can hard drive, and the lot number up here is 117922. So there's the SD can hard drive. It smells very minty. It's like a wintergreen smell, uh, and uh, this is going to go into the refrigerator. Uh, however, I honestly think that this stuff smells more like vinegar than it does wintergreen and that kind of thing. Uh, so uh, that's just kind of a, a personal nose preference. I just think it it's more sour than it is minty. Uh, next is aluminum chloride. Here's our aluminum chloride. This is a solid, and you'll see that in just a minute, but that aluminum chloride is the anhydrous version, and that means no water. We can't have water around in this lab experiment or it doesn't work. So this aluminum chloride is from EMD Manufacturer, and as far as the lot number, it's up here in the top left-hand corner. It is S as in Sam, and that is 5122681. So that is the lot number for aluminum chloride. So this is our reagent or really a catalyst that's required for this reaction to go forward. Finally, we need anisole, and anisole is this substituted benzene. This substituted benzene is a liquid as well. Uh, this comes from TCI America, that is the manufacturer with this. And the lot number is up here in the top right-hand corner of C, Z, Q, J, and F. Uh, so pretty short and sweet lot numbers that TCI America decided to use on that bottle right? Uh, this one, just a clear liquid. Uh, it does have an odor, but it's that traditional organic odor that you're always going to find in an organic laboratory. So very, uh, what I would call diesel-y smelling or uh, some kind of petrol smelling type of compound. So nothing special out of the ordinary for anisole here. Uh, the lab directions are also going to tell me to uh, perform this addition under reflux. And this is basically what that setup is going to look like. So uh, what I have here uh, to the uh, left-hand side of the picture is our variac. And our variac, uh, if you have not taken uh, Orgo 1 with me or if you've forgotten what the variac was for, this is just, again, the stove eye of the laboratory heating mantle. Uh, so this is going to allow me to control how much heat is going to go to the stove eye. And uh, I'm going to plug that box up into the outlet. And you see that here. And I'll just turn the knob. So the higher it goes, the more energy that's basically getting shot through and uh, the hotter that heating mantle is going to become. If I don't want it that hot, I turn the knob down. So again, think of it as the stove eye on your actual stove. Um, here is the heating mantle that it controls, and notice that you can see it plugged up to the heating mantle that's down there below, or to the variac. So variac is going to be here to the left, and this is what we call a heating mantle to the right-hand side. So I've got this nice little boiling flask that's sitting inside of this heating mantle. This is slowly going to get heated up. And this, uh, this variac allows me to control how fast and how hot that I want to go with it. Uh, up above is a, uh, a U adapter, and that U adapter is just a, kind of this divot. And the reason that we're using that is because it splits my path up into two. And directly above that bowling flask, you're going to see a separatory funnel. And that separatory funnel is located directly above, so that way I can open this up and allow this to directly drip down on the inside of that flask. I don't want it to kind of go over here to the right-hand side and then slowly drip and ooze down the side and then down into the bowling flask. I don't want that to happen. I want it to be a direct addition, so that way I ensure that everything is going into that bowling flask that I need. Over here to the right-hand side, this up on top of that split pathway is the condenser. And that condenser's uh, job is to condense any vapor that might form throughout this analysis and throughout the procedure. So uh, I'm going to heat this up. I'm going to generate some fume. That fume is going to go up into the uh, side arm or this U adapter. And then sooner or later, it's going to 
whoop, up into the condenser. And when it goes up into the condenser, it's going to hit a really cold condenser because there is water in always from the bottom and there's water out always up at the top. So uh, I'm circulating cold water throughout the condenser. That will stay cold. So that way, when the vapors go up into the condenser, they will go back to a liquid and they will begin to drip back down into this uh, U adapter and then back down into the boiling flask that sits down below. So that way it ensures I don't lose anything throughout the heating process. So uh, now let's take a look at maybe a, a, a video on uh, how in real time, I guess you can say that if that's really a thing in the virtual world, uh, this setup is going to take place. All right, so heating under reflux, what does it include? It includes a, a variac, which is going to control, it's kind of like a stove eye. It controls how much heat that I'm going to put into the frying pan. So there's the variac, and then that variac is heated to what we call a heating mantle. This is the heating mantle that's going to basically have the heat that's associated or that's needed for this reaction to take place. And of course, the variac controls how hot that actually gets. Here I have a boiling flask that all of my reagents will eventually go into. And then I have a adapter here. Uh, we call it a U adapter and that basically routes this thing into two different directions. So this is going to get heated up. Some gas is going to kind of evolve. Things are going to evaporate. Those vapors and fumes are going to rise up and then they're going to go into this part of the U adapter and up into this right hand piece, which is called the condenser. So the condenser is going to condense. That's why we call it the condenser. Those fumes back down into a liquid so it can go back down into the boiling flask. We do not want to lose anything. However, during this heating process, I'm going to have to add things. And this is why it's called a uh, reflux with addition. So what I'm going to add is actually going to be here into the separatory funnel. So I'm going to put my reagent that I need into the separatory funnel. It's probably going to be a liquid. I'm going to open up the stopcock here and I'm going to allow that liquid to drip very slowly down below into the boiling flask. That way when the glassware gets hot, when this reaction goes forward, I actually don't have to touch it. I don't have to move it. I don't have to disturb it. It can actually add, do its thing with just a slight motion of the stopcock getting opened and closed back once I get finished. So that is the uh, setup for what we call reflux under addition. All right. And that's going to be required for the anisole lab. Okay, so if we go back to the laboratory procedure, it's going to tell me to weigh out my starting reagents and that kind of thing. So here is the aluminum chloride. That container has been teared already. So that is the mass of the aluminum chloride, 3.092. Uh, this is quite a bit, and that's because the lab directions are written for this aluminum chloride to be in um, a lot of excess. So we have a lot of this that we're going to be adding. Not all of it's required. There'll be way more than enough at the very end, and that's okay. It's just ensuring that enough is there for the actual reaction to take place. And if any of this is deactivated in some form or fashion, maybe due to water that's lingering behind, then the extra is actually there for that purpose. So we know that nothing's going to be perfect in the real world. Uh, and if we calculated how much we actually needed for real, it would be way less than this. But we're going above and beyond here. All right. So uh, here's the close up of the aluminum chloride. This is what that ALCL stuff looks like. So it's just a, a white, grainy looking powder. Again, nothing fancy, uh, nothing that's going to be associated with it to kind of make it stand apart from the crowd. But that is what aluminum chloride actually looks like. So we've talked about it in lecture and now we're using it in real life. Okay. Uh, mass of the acetic anhydride is going to be next. So the acetic anhydride is a reagent that's going to be used here. And that acetic anhydride, again, this is from a teared container. And I've directly added the acetic anhydride to that container when I did this. And that is a 1.148 gram. So 1.148 grams of acetic anhydride 
will be used in the particular lab experiment that we're doing together. The acetic anhydride is here. Again, nothing special about it. Uh, just this uh, weird little, um, um, some people, again, just think of minty smell, but I think of this vinegary smell. I don't know how you can get them confused, but that's just what my nose tells me. So uh, this is a very clear solution, uh, colorless, of course. Uh, it just really looks like water there. And then finally, we need some methylene chloride, and the methylene chloride is going to come straight from a bottle here. The methylene chloride uh, has a Fisher chemical manufacturer, and this particular lot number is UN1593, or sorry, that's, that's the item code. The lot number is up here at the top. That's 203783. So again, it's 203783. So this is my methylene chloride. This, again, is going to be required for the aluminum chloride and the product to actually form. So we do not want water. We want water to stay away. And methylene chloride does a great job because it's an organic material that has no water associated with it. And it ensures that this reaction takes place in a non-aqueous environment. All right, so acetic anhydride, and we've got anisol, we've got our methylene chloride, and we have our aluminum chloride. All right, so uh, here's basically the setup again, and we're getting ready to add everything together. All right, so this actually tells me to make sure there's no water vapor that is left over in the glassware before we use it. Uh, so I'm just going to use a Bunsen burner here and um, I'm going to flame the glassware. So basically what that means is that the heat is going to hit the uh, glassware, make sure all of that water vapor is gone. I can see some of the cloudiness that is present. You know, this just helps kind of dry out any of the water that might be present. So I'm going to open up that cap. So if there's water vapor that's up here in the separatory funnel, that can leave as well. Uh, but I just uh, need rid of all the water. We've seen water problems, especially with like things like Grignard and stuff as well. Uh, so this is just going to help ensure that none of those byproducts or side reactions are going to destroy the actual product that we're going to be forming in this reaction. So uh, I could have done this in the oven, but actually, folks, I think this is very easy and much quicker if we just do it by hand with a Bunsen burner. Um, if I had a lot of prep work to do for the day, then I would definitely put it inside of the Bunsen burner or uh, inside of the oven uh, and allow that to kind of be ready by the time that I need it. But that's really all that we have to do. So it's as simple as that. All right, so the lab directions tell me to add my methylene chloride and add the anisole into the boiling flask with a very small magnet. Uh, I do have a, a very tiny magnet. It's basically right there. You can see it. Uh, it's like a little nugget, a little nugget of joy right here. All right, so I'm going to drop the magnet on the inside of the boiling flask. It's down in there. It's going to help me stir it. Uh, and I'm going to add a little bit of the anisole, uh, actually all of the anisole, uh, to the bowling flask through the separatory funnel joint. So I'm just going to allow it to drip down in there. A little over one gram is what we used. I want to make sure I get all of that out of there. So uh, what I'm, I'm going to do is add a little bit of the methylene chloride into that container. I'm going to put this back on and I'm going to give it a shake. Uh, and the reason for that is I want all of the anisole out of that container. I don't want to lose any product yield right here. Uh, so this is actually going to be the best way to do it. I'm going to have to add the methylene chloride anyway. So I want to make sure that that container gets completely flushed out with the anisole. So I'm going to do that in a second portion. And then finally, I'm going to do it in a third portion. And that methylene chloride is also going to cling to the sides of this piece of glass. And it's going to get rid of all of the anisole that might be lingering there as well. So the more times that I give it a flushing of methylene chloride, the better off we're going to be. All right, so the anisole, the methylene chloride is there. Uh, and we're going to stir or turn on our stir plate. Uh, and we're going to get that magnet going. So I'm going to put this separatory funnel back on top 
Again, I don't want any water moisture to get inside of here. I'm going to prevent it every possible way that I can. And then we're going to let this stir for uh, just a couple of minutes and we're eventually going to add our aluminum chloride to this. All right, folks, so I want to go back and I think that I made a mistake uh, when I showed you uh, this prep for the um, reagents that were required for the reaction. Uh, this is massive acetic anhydride. This is actually not acetic anhydride. This is the anisole that we were using in the lab. It's this anisole that is inside of that container that is 1.148 grams. The acetic anhydride will come a little bit later. Uh, that also means that this close-up that you're seeing here is not acetic anhydride. This close-up that you're seeing, once again, is anisole. So uh, acetic anhydride and anisole look almost identical. You cannot tell them apart from these containers, and I just now caught it because we have not yet added the acetic anhydride yet. Um, actually, the mass of acetic anhydride is not really important at all. Uh, only the mass of the anisole, which is going to be the limiting reagent in this reaction. So this is is anisol. So go back, correct your laboratory notebook, correct your notes, but this will be the starting mass of that reagent that we are using in the reaction. So here's a close-up of the addition. Uh, the anisole is inside of the flask and the methylene chloride is inside of the flask. Nothing major has happened here, as you can see. I mean, it still looks clear. It's colorless, uh, no bubbles, nothing really going on as far as anything that I need to make a note of for an observational change. However, statements like no observational change are just as important as if there were changes that happened when I added reagents together. Okay, uh, so now in this video, you're going to see uh, just an actual video of the uh, next part of the lab experiment. All right, so the magnet is stirring in my boiling flask, and now it's time for me to add the aluminum chloride. And it says to add it in very small portions. So I'm just going to come up here to the top, and I'm going to slowly add little bits at a time. Not all at once. I don't want it to overheat or begin to bubble on me. And you can see the addition of the aluminum chloride now. Right? So that disturbance is going to mess up the magnet a little bit. Not a big deal. It will eventually catch back up once this um, uh, uh, aluminum chloride begins to dissolve. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to continue to add the aluminum chloride in small batches. I mean, that's what it tells me to do, right? So uh, there was our first batch, and we'll continue to add that whole, it was almost three grams, into this compartment. You can make observations as you need. What you're seeing is probably a little bit of the aluminum chloride staying behind. It's not really fully dissolving quite yet. That's okay. It will. We're just getting it down into the jacuzzi tub with everything else. All right, so I'm going to continue to add the aluminum chloride just like this. I'm starting to see the flask is getting a little cloudy. It's probably a good sign that it's creating some heat for me, and it is. The crystals are starting to dissolve more and more, and this is pretty normal. So the directions actually tell me if I see a spike in temperature or if this stuff begins to kind of start boiling on its own to have some cold water that's ready and dunk that beaker down into some cold water. However, I'm going to go slow enough with it where hopefully I won't have to use that. It's, un it's not needed. It's unnecessary. It's an extra step, extra stuff that I've got to drag out. So with a little bit of patience, I'll be able to completely ignore that part if I'm lucky. All right, so I'm going to continue to add the aluminum chloride down into this boiling flask. Nothing too much is going to change, uh, and then we'll pick back up after that addition takes place. All right, so again, I want you to understand that the aluminum chloride is in way excess, uh, and we just do this to ensure that a reaction is going to take place with that catalyst. 
Uh, and you're probably also questioning, well, you know, you said that we were using this anhydride, uh, acetic anhydride. So this is nothing like what we talked about in lecture. Most of the time when we looked at acylation, we were looking at this kind of carbonyl and then maybe here and then maybe a chloro group that's there. And then we added ALCL3. Uh, you know, why aren't we doing it here? Well, one of the reasons is because this anhydride is much safer to use. That is why. And on top of that, it is also cost effective. So it's not as much money to get the anhydride versus just the acetyl chloride group. So the acylating agent of acetyl chloride uh, is actually a little bit more dangerous. It's not as safe. It's a little bit more money. And the acetic anhydride just is better on our wallet and better in a laboratory for us to actually use. So the idea and the concept is basically the same. It's just we're starting off with an unexpected reagent here for this reaction. So the acetic anhydride that we have just referred to is actually going to go into the separatory funnel. The lab directions tell me one milliliter. Uh, and I did weigh out one milliliter. I weighed out one milliliter using a micro pipette. So um, this was very convenient for me. I didn't need a super tiny graduated cylinder. I just micro pipetted one mil into a separatory funnel and it was one mil exactly and the lab directions are going to tell me to add it in small portions. The reason that it tells me to add it in small portions is that this reaction when all of these go down into the jacuzzi tub they are going to go hubba 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 with each other and when they do that a lot of heat is going to be generated and I don't want to do this all at one time. I want to go slow and I want to be safe. So here is the uh, next step of the laboratory procedure. Okay, so we're on our next step and we're getting ready to add the acetic anhydride that you saw in the separatory funnel just a second ago. So uh, I'm going to open the separatory funnel up. Uh, just a little bit, and I'm going to allow this stuff to drip. It says very slowly, like one drop every three seconds, give or take from there. Uh, so that's really um, kind of uh, an idea or a hint to go slow with this. Uh, again, if I generate a lot of heat, I don't really want to uh, have that problem. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to allow it to kind of do its thing, drip, 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 very slowly down into the flask. You're seeing how slow this is going to go. Uh, and at this point right now, no really observational changes are happening. So uh, it's just once again, getting in the jacuzzi tub, getting to know each other. And this process is going to take a little bit. So aluminum chloride is inside of the flask. Acetic anhydride, which is a reagent, is now getting added to the flask. And anisole, which was already in the flask, is present and it's meeting the acetic anhydride and hopefully the aluminum chloride is going to introduce it to the acetic anhydride up above and they will madly fall in love and give us product babies. So that's what we're after. So we'll see what this stuff is going to do uh, here in a little bit. All right, so here's a close-up of uh, after the addition has taken place with the acetic anhydride from the separatory funnel. This is just a, a closer picture of what's happening inside of the bowling flask. So notice this foam that is around the flask. The solution has this milky color, uh, almost kind of going on the verge of a beige color for the solution. It's also very cloudy. I can't see through it anymore. So it's a very good sign that a reaction is taking place. So I finished uh, dripping the acetic anhydride into the flask below. Uh, you can see it's still kind of this milky, soupy, crystally, not all of the aluminum chloride has dissolved. And now it tells me to turn on the heat. Uh, and I have, I've turned the heat on uh, using the Variac that's to my left. And uh, we're starting to heat this up a little bit hotter. Uh, also, at the same time, I'm going to turn on the water that goes into my reflux condenser. The water is going to keep it cold. 
and that cold condenser, if I lose anything at all from this flask as it begins to generate some vapor, that condenser is going to push it back down into the boiling flask for me. All right, so that's the next step of the procedure, and that's what we'll do together. All right, so the heat to my uh, heating mantle is now on. Uh, I'm seeing that I'm getting a little bit of heat here. I'm going to crank it up just a little bit to get it into the green. Uh, we do want this to be warm, and we want it to be boiling, so we just don't want to overdo it. Uh, also, uh, here you can see the tubing that's leading to the bottom of the condenser that's right there. I need to turn the water on in order for that to kind of do its thing. Uh, so I'm going to turn the water on very slowly and you'll start to see water begin to fill up um, my condenser so that way it will get cold and it will stay cold for when I need it. All right, so we're just going to let this kind of hang out, do its thing, uh, and then uh, we'll come back to it after 30 minutes like the procedure tells us to do. All right, so here's a, a picture of the setting on the Variac. It looks like it's just a little bit above 75 on the dial of the Variac itself, uh, which means that I'm about at the halfway point. I'm not cooking on super hot heat, but yet I'm not cooking on low heat either. I'm kind of right in the middle. So I'm just going to leave it here. The 30 minutes actually hasn't started yet. And the reason is because it says a 30 minute reflux time and reflux means the first drip. So that is where the time is actually going to start. So I'll give that to you in just a minute. But just because I turned the heat on, this does not count toward the time of the actual reflux. It means refluxing for 30 minutes, not turn the heat on and then wait for 30 minutes. There is a difference in that laboratory procedure direction. All right, there's my aluminum chloride solution that's beginning to bubble, bubble. So uh, we're going to let this thing kind of do what it needs to do. And in 30 minutes, we'll come back and take a look. Uh, it does say to gently boil. I'm really uncomfortable with the amount of boiling that's happening here. Uh, if I fill the flask, it's actually very, very cool. Uh, it's not hot at all. Uh, meaning that this stuff is kind of boiling on its own at this point. It's generating its own heat, and that heat is beginning to warm up the flask just a little bit, uh, but not much at all. So the aluminum chloride is doing what the aluminum chloride is supposed to be doing, and my reaction is now taking off. So here they are madly falling in love. Uh, they are making some product babies at this point, and I need to give them 30 minutes alone in the jacuzzi tub before I bother them anymore. All right. So once again, you can use this, make some observational changes, uh, write those down into your lab book. Uh, but you are seeing that the crystals are dissolving. Uh, no longer are those actual crystals in solution. It's now just a milky, buttery type of looking um, liquid that I have in the bowling flask. So 30 minutes, we'll come back. Uh, all right, folks, so uh, this process started uh, for me at 12, well, if this will write, 12, 14 p.m. in the afternoon. So that will just give you a time stamp, stamp on when this process actually began to reflux, meaning it's starting to boil and I'm seeing the first drip from my condenser. That is when I clock the time and this happened or started happening at 12, 14 in the afternoon. All right, so this is part of the uh, reflux condenser, and I want to show you this because you can actually physically see the condensation here. So you can see the droplets that are forming inside of the condenser apparatus that we have on top, but nothing really is happening up here toward the top of the screen. It's all here, and we call that the condensation ring. So as long as that kind of liquid droplet doesn't approach the top of this condenser, like the very, very top, I know that I'm not losing any vapor that that's beginning to happen here with the reaction. Uh, so uh, that's just kind of one thing I want to point out. Uh, it is something that as a laboratory person, this is something that I would kind of monitor and make sure that it's not getting out of hand. Uh, so condensation's good. I see the ring that's basically right here. You can see the cloudiness there, some clear here at the top, 
and then you can see all the droplets that are beginning happen down here at the bottom. All of those are product droplets that I do not want lost. So all of these are dripping back down into solution and then as I follow it, uh, I see those extra drops getting here in the YouTube and then as far as the YouTube goes, uh, I'm going to kind of just swerve over. This looks like brownish stained, but that's not. It's just the cabinet that's actually behind it. Uh, so nothing is actually happening here in the YouTube condenser. And then as I continue to go down, I'm beginning to see this um, white milky solution that's still there, still kind of bubbling, still doing its job, still frothy, but this is a sign that the reaction's going forward like it should. So again, uh, we're looking at another 20 minutes or so, give or take, and I'll pull this away and then we'll go on to the next part of the procedure. All right, so in the video, um, you are probably getting a little bit of product baby that's happening as far as the drips go. Uh, but quite honestly, a lot of that is also the methylene chloride. Methylene chloride has a really low boiling point, And what you are seeing is a low boiling point organic compound uh, getting released from that boiling flask and traveling up the condenser as well. So a lot of that is methylene chloride. There could be some product that's also mixed in but quite a bit of it is methylene chloride. Uh, so uh, we'll just continue on video after video uh, and we'll continue to watch this process as it heats and as it refluxes. All right, so here's the last leg of the Anisol lab and uh, you can look at this boiling flask again, uh, very warm, but it's not like super hot where I can't touch it with my hand. So uh, this is just really the nature of the low boiling point bethylene chloride, and it doesn't take a lot of heat in order to get these uh, reagents to react together. So uh, not a big issue at all. It's just kind of weird when you see it and you were looking at me just putting my hand on something that's boiling like spaghetti water on the inside. So this anisole is almost finished uh, and in the next step it's telling us to take this solution that we have here and we're going to pour it over crushed ice. It's almost like I'm making a mixed drink. It's kind of strange, but it's one of the few times that we see something like that stated that way in a, in a laboratory procedure. So I'm going to get a beaker of crushed ice. I'm going to take this solution that's here and I'm going to slowly pour it on top of the cold ice and I'm going to let, allow it to get super cold, super fast. And hopefully we start to see some product that gets formed from this reaction by doing that. So uh, some of the observations that you can kind of make note of in the bowling flask, uh, it's still milky, it's still creamy, uh, not as foamy as it was when it was reacting, but I also see some crystals that are forming here on the outside of the flask. So once again, that's another good sign. It might be some of the aluminum chloride that hasn't reacted, uh, that's just left over, uh, or it could actually be product. It could be either or, but uh, that's going to be the part of the next step. So the water is going to help me decompose all of that remaining aluminum chloride that might be left over. Remember, in the beginning, we flamed all of this, and that way we could get rid of all of the water vapor or water droplets that might be behind. Now we're going to add water because if there's any extra, I want it gone before we go to the next step of the uh, procedure. All right. Uh, also, uh, kind of strange, but you're seeing the drops that are happening here. Uh, it's like a drip, 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 drip. And you can see big, big drops that are happening. Every time it does that, it sounds like someone is in the lab beating a drum. It's very strange. So tiny little drops are hitting the bowling flask and every time I hear a drum-like noise that begins to happen. I actually thought somebody was outside of the building beating on a drum in a parade. Uh, so uh, it's kind of weird, kind of strange, but that is an observational note uh, that I can somewhat make because that is somewhat out of the ordinary. All right, so next step, we're pouring it over crushed ice. We're a bartender. All right, so the next step, like I said, is fairly strange, and some people do have questions on why we do it the way that we do it. Uh, keep in mind that this reaction is using excess aluminum chloride, so ALCL3. 
there's a lot of this that's going to be left over that has not reacted and it hasn't really done anything, but we don't want this to interfere after the last step of the reaction takes place. So what we do is that we pour this stuff over cracked ice. And uh, the reason for that is it's a water source and the water will actually deactivate that aluminum chloride. So this is the purpose of the very next step that we're getting ready to do. So any extra aluminum chloride that will be left over, untouched, unreacted, it has to go away. We're going to have to get rid of it in some form. We're going to have to deactivate it. And the easiest way to do that is just add water to it. All right, so that is the purpose of the very next step. And that's what you're going to see in the next video. All right, so before I start this video, I just uh, want to go back and, and tell you that the reflux stopped at 12.52 p.m. That is when I took it off of the reflux apparatus and we are getting ready to go to the next step, which is pouring it over cracked ice and what looks like a bug that's inside of the cracked ice. So that looks kind of weird and strange, doesn't it? All right, so the next step tells me to take my um, reagent that's in the boiling flask, and that's basically right here. Uh, you can see uh, once this comes into focus, uh, it's still that milky, kind of buttery looking uh, solution that we had in the boiling flask all along. And then it tells me to pour that over, slowly pour that over uh, 10 grams of crushed ice, and that's what you're seeing here on the screen. Uh, so uh, I'm going to slowly... Well, first, it looks like some crud is there, so I'm going to get rid of that. Uh, and uh, it says to slowly pour it over the cracked ice, and that's what we're doing. Uh, so uh, notice that um, the solution is starting to precipitate out this whitish looking uh, crystal, and then it also looks like I'm getting some water droplets uh, that really is not water at all. It's just um, not soluble in the water, uh, and uh, it's settling out on the bottom. So uh, now I get this crud that's left over into the flask. Uh, look at that. That's all solid. Every bit of that is solid right there. So it tells me to use a little bit of methylene chloride and then uh, get this out of the actual container uh, and uh, pour it over the crushed ice as well. So that's the next step. That's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to rinse uh, this flask out with some methylene chloride uh, and that way I can get all of that solid out and into that flask with the ice down below. All right. So after all of that was transferred, here's a picture of the beaker, and you can clearly see two layers of liquid in the beaker. I'm seeing one layer that's up here at the top, and then I see another layer with our magnet that's down here in the bottom, and we need to separate those two layers from each other. The reason that there's two layers at this step is because we used methylene chloride or dichloromethane, DCM, as part of the reagent in the reaction, and now I've added water to this whole setup. And water and methylene chloride, they hate each other. One's polar, one's not polar. They never get along. And they begin to separate in the beaker. So that's the purpose of the separatory funnel step that you will see in the upcoming videos. Okay, so uh, there's the boiling flask that we had, and uh, I used about three, I would say, two mil portions of methylene chloride. I uh, squirted methylene chloride in here, gave it a swirl, and dumped it out really quickly into the ice uh, bath down below. Uh, so I did that three times, total of six to seven milliliters, give or take. Again, it's just estimation, uh, just to help in the transfer to make sure I don't lose any product uh, throughout this uh, next step of the process. So uh, now the lab direction is going to say, once you've poured it into the ice bath, rinse out any residue, which we did, and then it says remove the aqueous layer in the separatory funnel. So now I'm going to have to take this ice water and uh, I'm going to have to go over to a separatory funnel 
and I'm going to have to pour it all in and then two layers are probably going to be present and I need to drain off the water layer. I only want the organic layer because I'm after an organic product and it would not be in an aqueous layer. It's in the organic layer which is the methylene chloride that's still here. Uh, so all of this is going to get transferred to a separatory funnel and that's our next step. Okay, so I've got a new separatory funnel here, and the purpose of the separatory funnel is to separate. So I'm going to pour this uh, anisol product solution into my separatory funnel. I'm going to make sure that it's closed, of course, uh, and I'm going to see that two layers are going to begin to separate in the separatory funnel. There's going to be a water layer, and then there's also going to be more of an aqueous layer. Uh, so I can see that there. My magnet, of course, has fell uh, into the separatory funnel and that's not a big deal folks I can get that out quite easily but you can see two different layers distinctively in the separatory funnel I see one here and then I see one here uh, now the issue is well which one is which how do I know which is aqueous and which is the methylene chloride well, the answer here is density. Density is going to tell you which one is which because the density for water is one and the density of methylene chloride I might have to look up. Or if I don't want to take the time to look up the nice trick in a laboratory, look, I've got this flask or this beaker that I had my product in. I'm going to use a little bit more methylene chloride to transfer that over so I don't lose anything uh, or help prevent loss. And I'm just going to keep an eye on which layer gets bigger because whichever layer gets bigger, that is the methylene chloride layer. So keep an eye on which layer is going to increase. And hopefully that will give you a better judgment on which one's which. Uh, if not, we'll do it again. No big deal. I can use as much methylene chloride as I want. That's not an issue. So I'm going to add a few more squirts of methylene chloride or dichloromethane, DCM, into the beaker. And again, take a look at what happens on the separatory funnel. So I'm going to put my finger right here. That's the layer that begins to form, and does the top get bigger, or does the bottom get bigger? All right, so I think that you'll be able to determine which layer is which. So I'm going to have to drain off the water layer, meaning that if the methylene chloride is here at the bottom, I'll need to drain that off, capture it, and then funnel out the rest of the water and get rid of it. Or if the water is at the bottom, I just simply have to drain the water off and call it a day. So use your judgment, figure out which layer is which. If you're unsure, take a look at density, but I'm going to get rid of the water layer and I'm gonna put the methylene chloride layer into the separatory funnel in the next step. Okay, so I'm getting ready to drain the bottom layer off and it's pretty easy. I just open up the separatory funnel and allow it to slowly drain into a beaker that I've got sitting down below. You probably can't see that in the screen, uh, but uh, that's all that really I'm doing. So nothing special there at the kind of the tail end of the screen that you can't see. So I'm gonna allow this solution just to kind of continue to drain. Notice that this is tapered. The reason that it's tapered is because the closer that it gets toward this end, the better off uh, the separation is going to be. So you're gonna see me kind of slow it down at a certain point, uh, and then I'm just gonna to continue to let it drip into the container down below until it actually gets to the stopcock hole. And then at that point, I'm going to stop it. And then I'm going to remove this bottom layer. All right. Now this layer is a different layer. So I'm also going to drain that as well into a separate container. Just allow it. I could actually just take the separatory funnel off and just pour it out that way. But I'll always just like to give it a good flush. So it's just procedural. Okay. So I'm going to close the separatory funnel off. So I've got these two solutions now, and out of these two solutions, I'm then going to have to do another step, and that step is with the methylene chloride layer, I'm going to add three molarity sodium hydroxide. 
So that's our next step. All right, so in the next step, it's going to ask me to add three molarity NaOH. And I didn't have any of this on hand. I was going to have to make it myself. And I've made it from a six molarity NaOH solution that was already prepared for me by someone else. So this is just going to be a stock solution of six molar. And I need to make a three molar. So I need to cut this concentration by half, right? So this is pretty easy to do in my head. For instance, if I need 10 milliliters of a 3 molar NaOH, then I would use 5 mils of a 6 molar and 5 mils of DI water. And that will cut, because I'm doubling the volume, it will cut the concentration in half by a factor of 2. So this will end up with a 3 molar NaOH, and then I can use 5 milliliters of that solution that I've made in order for the reaction to proceed in the next step and for the cleanup to happen. Now, um, if that is uncomfortable for you to do in your head, go back to general chemistry. And we talked about a dilution equation during that time. So it's MV equals MV. So for instance, I have a six molar solution and I wanna know how much volume of that do I need in order to make a three molar solution and I wanna make 10 milliliters in total. So three times 10 is 30 and then six times X is six X and then I divide each side by six and X will give me the amount in volume, milliliter wise, because that's the unit that was used for this example, that will tell me how many mils of the six molar that I need to add and then dilute to a final volume of 10 mils because I said that's how much that I need it to make, all right? So a little bit of review of general chemistry solution prep information there. So here is the graduated cylinder. I've measured five milliliters of a three molar NaOH but I have made that from the six molar stock. There's also another part of this procedure that's gonna ask for a saturated salt solution. Uh, salt is just NaCl. I did not take a picture of this label, so the label is just gonna to have to be unknown. I forgot to do that when I used it. And saturated solutions are very easy. So I take just a little bit of water. Here you can see about 20 mils of water in total. And I just keep adding salt to it until the salt doesn't dissolve anymore. And you see that here on the bottom of the beaker. So when no more salt is getting dissolved, that is a saturated solution because it doesn't dissolve any more of it, and that is it. And that is a very easy way to make saturated solutions in a lab. I don't need to weigh out anything. I don't need to measure anything. I just eyeball it, folks. I use my gut. So a little bit of water, add salt, add salt, add salt, until no more dissolves and it just settles on the bottom. All right, so in the next step, I'm going to add the methylene chloride back in, and I did, and it tells me to add a three molarity solution of sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide's a base. It's gonna kinda help neutralize and do a pretty important step uh, that you'll find out about in the pre-lab lectures if you've done that, uh, and I'm gonna slowly add the sodium hydroxide in. All right, so there's my sodium hydroxide. Five milliliters is not a lot, folks. So on the computer, or on the, uh, your screen, uh, you could see a small layer that's forming on top. I don't know if you can really see that or not, but it's right, right here. Uh, however, if I lower this down, just bear with me, you might be able to see that a little bit better. All right. So uh, this is the small addition of sodium hydroxide that I've just added to the separatory funnel. Now, I can't just do this and then just call it a day, right? I'm going to have to put the lid back onto the separatory funnel, and I'm going to have to get these two layers to actually swish back and forth. So I just kind of take this, I kind of give the separatory funnel a nice shake, like I'm a bartender behind the bar, and then I'll point it up, and I'll open up the stopcock, and when I do, you heard that hiss. And then I'm going to close that back. 
and then I'll raise this up and I'll give it another shake. So you really do want these two layers to mix very well with each other. But if you do not vent the separatory funnel, then your pressure is going to build up and you could have an explosion on your hands. Methylene chloride is very volatile, so all of those vapors are going to fill up that separatory funnel if you're not careful. Uh, so this is my third time doing it. And I heard the hiss, and I'll close it back. And now I'll just put the separatory funnel back onto the uh, ring stand, and I'll just kind of let it sit here just for a few moments before I go further on the next step. Patience is a virtue, my friend. All right, so uh, once again, I'm gonna drain the methylene chloride layer. I have to, because I've got another separation step, and that involves, uh, this time, saturated sodium chloride. So I'm gonna take the lid off the separatory funnel. If I do not do that, um, it builds up pressure and it will never drain. Uh, so I'm going to uh, know now that this is your sodium hydroxide from the previous step. I only added five milliliters. That's the tiniest layer, uh, so that is the, um, uh, sodium hydroxide that we need to get rid of. So I'm going to slowly open the stopcock. I'm going to drain the methylene chloride out. And that's what you're seeing in the video now. And then here up at the top, that is the sodium hydroxide that I do not want. So before that goes through the separatory funnel, I'm going to stop the separatory funnel at that moment. And then I'll drain that into a discard beaker. I don't want that. I don't need it. Uh, it's going to eventually go down the drain. So, um, We'll just make sure that that happens. All right, so as I get closer to the taper side, you're seeing that the uh, layers become a little bit more developed as far as separation goes. And uh, I'm just gonna slow down on the drips at this point. And I'm going to allow that to go through the stopcock and we'll cut it off at that moment. Uh, notice here, I'm seeing a lot of cloudiness that's forming. Um, you know, if I zoom in maybe a little bit, you're seeing some of that like floaty looking material in here and that's pretty normal. Sodium hydroxide is doing what sodium hydroxide's doing. It's kind of getting rid of some of these byproducts that we don't want and helping to make sure that we get a very clean organic product uh, at the end result of this. All right, so uh, now this sodium hydroxide we're gonna get rid of. I'm just gonna drain it into the same beaker that I drained the water into. So not a big deal there. So in it goes. All right. Uh, so now at this point, uh, we're going to put the methylene chloride back into the separatory funnel. And again, this is where all of my product is at. So I'm just helping clean it. That's all that I'm doing. And uh, when I do that, the next step, I need to add saturated sodium chloride. So again, five milliliters worth. I'll pour the saturated sodium chloride into the separatory funnel. Saturated just means add salt until it no longer dissolves in solution. And then take five mils, basically is what we used, uh, and add it to the separatory funnel with the methylene chloride. All right, so I'm going to put the lid back on the separatory funnel. And now I'm going to shake and repeat. All right, in the next step of the Anisol lab, uh, it tells me to distill off all of the methylene chloride. So basically what that means is that in the flask that I have here, uh, we have this um, methylene chloride that's still remaining and we need to get rid of it. So I'm going to put that onto the, uh, what we call a rotary evaporator. Uh, and I'm just gonna kind of lock that boiling flask into place and this is an automated way that we can set up a uh, distillation setup. Uh, so uh, on the control panel that makes my job very easy I'm going to lower that flask down into some boiling water and it's not really boiling yet but it will be soon uh, and then here on the control panel I can actually hit start and that will start turning uh, this uh, bowling flask around and around and around for you. So let me just kind of zoom in and uh, give you a better view of what's going on. Uh, so I'm just going to push the button on the um, water bath 
and uh, we are going to get this kind of to take off and begin to heat. So this water bath will begin to heat. It will get above the methylene chloride boiling point, which is actually very low. And then it will start distilling off the methylene chloride that is here in my boiling flask. So after that moment begins, my methylene chloride goes around to the left and uh, it will eventually make its way here into a receiving flask so I can use it for another purpose if that's what I want to do. So I'm just going to kind of let this turn, I'm going to let this heat, and uh, I'm going to come back in a few minutes and just take a look. And at that point, all of my methylene chloride hopefully will be gone and I won't have to worry about it. It makes my life very, very uh, simple as far as the distillation process goes. So no glassware, nothing crazy, nothing fancy is going to be needed. Uh, on the um, water bath, it's a typical water bath, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, there's really nothing here that's special. Uh, this is the temperature right now of the water that's in uh, the water bath at 26 degrees. You can see it's heating up. Um, not fast, but it's not slow either. I mean, it will be there in a few minutes. And I've set this thing at 87 degrees. Uh, so I can lower that down if I want to. Um, actually, I probably can already. I know methylene chloride uh, is not going to take a lot of heat in order to go somewhere. So I'm just going to kind of stop that at 69 degrees. Uh, in the lab directions, uh, it actually tells me to distill it. Uh, until I get to 250 degrees and collect everything after 250 degrees. I'm not going to go through that step and the reason is because it's not quite necessary. Um, I'm just going to assume that if there's impurities that are present, we're okay with those impurities, but I'm not going to go take the time of heating a piece of glassware super hot above 250 degrees and collect that product. Uh, if I have product that product will be in this flask after my methylene chloride goes away. And if it has impurities, then so be it. It's got impurities. But the majority of my product will be there, and the majority of my product will be pure, I hope. Keep the fingers crossed. All right, so the uh, simple distillation is actually going now. The rotary evaporator is doing its job. Uh, this solution in the boiling flask uh, that you see to the right-hand side, um, it's withering away because the removal of the methylene chloride is making it shrink in volume. And sooner or later, I'm just going to have product that's left over with no methylene chloride at all, and that's really what I want to see. And over here to the left-hand side, of the flask, you're seeing that that's where the methylene chloride is going. So it's evaporating, it's leaving, and over here in this compartment, uh, it's actually uh, condensing because there's a condenser on that side, and all of that methylene chloride is uh, getting saved into that flask, which we call the receiving flask, uh, to the left-hand side. Um, so uh, that's kind of uh, the purpose of a rotary evaporator. That's exactly what I want to see, uh, and uh, it looks pretty good. So over here, you're seeing a little bit of bubble that's beginning to form, and that's a very good sign that methylene chloride is kind of almost getting out and uh, fully escaping. Uh, so I'm just going to continue to let it do this. Methylene chloride will eventually go away. I will not see those bubbles anymore when no methylene chloride is left over, and that's a very good sign for me to stop. Uh, so at that point, I'll uh, go to the next part of the lab procedure, which tells me to pour this onto a watch glass and just kind of let it do what it needs to do and come back to it after it cools down to room temperature and it uh, somewhat dries out. Uh, so uh, that's what you're gonna see me do next. And we'll just let the rotary evaporator do its job and, and continue to make my life very easy. All right, so if you want a picture of the close-up rotovap, here it is. And it, nothing really special again that's happening inside the flask. And actually, at this point, I began to get a little worried. So just because I know how this lab is supposed to turn out and how I know that this product is supposed to look, I wasn't quite happy with what I was visually seeing in the bowling flask as it began to distill. I knew that this was not really a finished product or the product that I wanted or that I was after. So I made the decision to go back and do what 
all over again. That's right, all over again. Now, that means that you do not have to watch another 1 hour and 12 minutes and 46 seconds of a video, but we can just quickly fast forward and see how different these observations are. So what you're seeing in this particular video is a um, image or a video feed uh, not taken with the actual kind of legit camera that we use, uh, but with a camera that our laboratory technician uh, was using during that time with just her cell phone. And we took what was inside that boiling flask and we went back, added more aluminum chloride that we had dehydrated. We had put it into an oven. We had completely driven off the water. We had made sure that this was really activated aluminum chloride. And we went back to that point and we began refluxing all over again. So we were adding the acetic anhydride at this point and the aluminum chloride, and we started to see observational changes that began to happen during that time. So it became more orangey. It became more brown at that part of the reaction. And then we got to the separatory funnel step, and the separatory funnel step looked different as well. So over here to the left-hand side, that's kind of our first addition of a separatory funnel. I see some dark bluish gray color here at the bottom with this smaller kind of volume up here at the top. And then our next separatory funnel addition, we start to see this really deep, dark, almost black looking color at the bottom of the separatory funnel. And up at here at the top, this is more of a sagey green color that's happening. Finally, we put this back into the separatory funnel. And now we see more of a sage green, forest green color that appears as far as the product goes. Uh, what you're seeing here to the right hand side is just the kind of remnants of the salting out and, and uh, that kind of process taking place. And then finally, our last separatory funnel is going to come from this pole, uh, which looks a little bit darker green at this moment. So a lot of color changes actually began to happen when we went back and dehydrated the aluminum chloride in the oven for a few hours before we used it again. Uh, that material went to a um, distillation setup. Uh, the laboratory technician did not use the rotavap like I used. Um, instead, uh, it was just a quick, simple addition of a sidearm flask that you're seeing here, and then a condenser tube that's to the left. It does the same thing that the rotary vapor does, but uh, it was just more convenient for her to actually assemble this very quickly uh, and start distilling it over. Uh, to the right-hand side, you see that that product here is more of a greenish color. Uh, that she has uh, ended up with. And then uh, we're going to capture anything that comes over on the left-hand side. And then finally, after that distillation took place, this is what we ended up with on the um, watch glass. So this is the product that has formed now from the reaction. And this is typically what we do see after that distillation takes place. It's more of a dark burnt caramelly color, very dark brown. It has the odor of like Play-Doh. That is what it reminds me of. And this is typically what we see every time that we do this lab. So I felt much better about this particular product. And the first round was just a sign that the aluminum chloride, because it was anhydrous, was not necessarily anhydrous. There was too much water weight associated with it. And it couldn't do the job that the aluminum chloride was supposed to do in the acylation reaction. So what you're seeing on the screen is um, a mass, and that mass says actually up there, if you can read it, 53.761, all right? So 53.761, that is the mass of um, uh, our, the laboratory technician uh, when she decided to uh, look and monitor and measure that product. So up here to the uh, top left, you're seeing the 53.761, and that is the watch glass and the product that she ended up with. And then 52.4174, which was just the mass of the watch glass on its own. So you can take those two numbers, figure out how much product that we ended up with, and then use that to calculate percent yields when you calculate theory yield. All right. Uh, again, one of those questions that I'm taking for granted that maybe I shouldn't, 
would be how to calculate theory yield, right? So how much do we actually end up with? I want you to go back and I want you to take a look at the starting amount of anisole because that starting amount of anisole is the most important piece because that is what's going to form our product. And our anisole product here was 1.148 gram. All right, so I need to set up a dimensional analysis problem with that 1.148 gram of anisole. So this is the setup that I'm going to start with. And again, I can't do anything in grams. I'm going to have to get mole, which is the common language of all of the molecules. And I do that by using formula weight because formula weight is grams per mole. So gram on top, gram on the bottom, and I want to go to mole of anisole. And from that table in the laboratory procedure, so let me pull up that table. Uh, it looks like this. I see anisole is right here. And anisole looks like it has a molecular weight of 108.2. All right, so 108.2 is uh, what we need to use here. 108.2 grams per every one mole. And based on that reaction, it is a one-to-one. -one. So for every one molecule of anisole, I'm of course going to end up with one molecule of this anisole-related product. So it is a one-to-one -one mole ratio. So that means one mole of anisole, mole of anisole here, mole of anisole there. I need to go to moles of the product, and that is a one-to-one. -one. So the numbers are not going to change. That's mole of product on top. Mole of product needs to go on the bottom, and I need to go to gram of product. So how do I do this? Well, I go back to the data table, and it looks like these are the possibilities of what we're going to end up with. Two prime, three prime, or four prime. And it looks like no matter what it is, it's just the position that's different, folks. That's all. The position that's different is the 150.2 moles or grams per mole. So no matter what. So that means mole here, how many grams are in one mole? Well, that table told me it's 150.2 grams. So this number of grams will be our theory amount. And then we need to calculate the percent yield. And to calculate the percent yield, I take the actual amount that we obtained in the lab, I divide by the theory amount, and I multiply by a 100. And that is our percent yield. If I was asked to do percent error, then I could do that by taking 100 minus the yield amount. That is how they're related. The yield and the error need to add up to be 100%. All right, so that's a little bit about the mass. That's a little bit about product yield. We can calculate theory, kind of do some math and some calculations on that end. And then uh, finally, uh, here we need to figure out, well, where's the position? First, did I get what I was supposed to get? And then second, if so, where is the position? So what you're going to find attached to this data sheet uh, is the infrared spectrum of the product that you saw from that very last slide. So I need you to go back, take a look at the FTIR videos on maybe the last lab experiment that we did, which was the uh, zinc and the unknown carboxylic acid lab. At the very end of that, I gave you a pretty in-depth step of how to operate and use an FTIR instrument. So we did the same thing there. There's no difference. It's the same process, same step, same ATR attachment, same software and everything, except this was a crystal. And just like in the last video, we put a few crystals on the center of the diamond and we had it to analyze it. And this is what we ended up with. This is what it looks like. So this is the anisol product that we're going to end up with. And there's a few things that I need to make sure of. First, I need to make sure that we actually are making a carbonyl compound because that was what made this product special versus the reagent. So first question, first, is a carbonyl present, yes or no? And you will be able to tell that from the FTIR. And in the lab directions uh, on the grade sheet, you're going to see it's going to tell you to circle the areas that had you to make these conclusions. So there's your FTIR. You can print that off. You can circle it. You can do what you need to do with it and attach it to your laboratory write-up or your laboratory report. Uh, next, it's then going to ask, okay, well, is it an O, is it an M, or is it a P director? And that is going back to this table 
and figuring it out. So for instance, if we did not have any product at all, we would see a pretty major band at 770 to 730. So if I go to 770, that's going to be like right here to 730. We're going to be in this area right there. And if I go up in this range, I'm not really seeing major peaks that form. So that means we at least made some type of product. Something has went on because we do not have five hydrogens that are side by side. And those are the only five available spots because the OCH3 takes up the sixth one on the benzene ring. So go through that table, look at where these bands are supposed to be located, and then take a look at these and see if there are major bands in those regions. And if there are, then you can kind of make the determination of where this uh, incoming acyl group has went. The C double bond O with a CH3 group. Is it the ortho? Is it the meta? Or is it the para? So that is where I'll leave this video. You have everything that you need now in order to finish up the lab right up, report some results, talk about some product formation, talk about some benzene as well as carbonyl reactions, and then go in and do a little bit of review of FTIR or infrared spectrum. So again, Again, I told you this lab is wonderful because it wraps up all of those lecture ideas and topics together into one fell swoop. So just like always, if you've got questions, let me know. One hour and 24 minutes later, we are now done with the video. But folks, I've said it before and I'll say it again. If you were in person and you were taking this class on campus, you would have had to done all of these steps all on your own and look at all the time and look at all the trouble that I have saved you from doing that. And you would have been on campus for three or more hours trying to get this lab done. So I've done you a humongous favor in doing it for you, letting you look at my observations, letting you look at my data. And then the only thing that you have to do on your end, like a good lab partner, is to write it up and report your findings. All right, so good luck. Let me know if I can help you in any way. You know how to reach out if you do.